Sanctions are a topic that often go underreported. They're seen by most people as being some kind of tame, mild alternative to war. But they're just as destructive as war, if not more. They're a modern equivalent of siege warfare, just like when armies would surround a city, cutting off its food supplies and isolating the inhabitants until they either surrendered or died of malnutrition and disease. Today I want to talk about two countries, Venezuela and Syria, that are subject to some of the worst sanctions, although they're not the only ones. I'm Richard Medhurst and you're watching The Communique. The United States has been trying to topple the governments of Venezuela and Syria for a while now. Independent socialist countries who refuse to serve the financial and geopolitical interests of the United States usually do end up being cooed, invaded, or sanctioned, sometimes all three. After all, this isn't something new. Uh, there isn't a country in Central or Latin America that the United States hasn't meddled in. We've seen the United States overthrow the democratically elected president of Guatemala in 1954. We saw a CIA-backed coup in Chile in 1973. The United States was financing death squads in Nicaragua and El Salvador in the 1980s, bombing Grenada in 1983, and much more. It's quite an extensive list. And it's important, of course, to underline this and point out the recent history, just so that there's no illusions of what's going on here. The United States and their partners are interested in regime change and will do so for economic reasons, as they have done so in the past. Again, it's no coincidence that Venezuela, besides being an anti-imperialist socialist nation, also happens to sit on the world's largest reserves of oil. Now, sanctions against Venezuela date back to the days of the Bush regime. Every U.S. president since has taken steps to expand the embargo on Venezuela. In 2014 and 2015, Barack Obama imposed further sanctions on Venezuela, freezing assets and issuing travel bans. Then when Donald Trump took over as president, he imposed even more sanctions as part of his maximum pressure campaign. In January 2019, Trump targeted Venezuela's oil sector. The oil embargo included the Trump administration blocking sales from Venezuela's state-owned oil, oil company, oil. PDVSA, and then seizing its U.S. subsidiary, Citgo, which is worth billions. Remember, Venezuela relies heavily on its exports of oil for that stream of revenue, and Trump also proceeded to target its financial sector in March 2019 and its defense and security sector in May 2019. Now, although the United States claims it imposes sanctions to punish certain government officials and ministers for, you know, alleged human rights abuses and cracking down on protesters, something the United States has no problem doing on its own citizens, the United States isn't acting as some kind of benevolent moral arbiter. It wants to replace the Venezuelan government with someone more favorable to the interests of Washington, D.C., which is why the United States has been propping up the former leader of the National Assembly in Venezuela, Juan Guaido. This guy, who most Venezuelans haven't even heard of, is essentially their stooge. He's a puppet that they want to put in place in order to further their political and economic interests. As per usual, the European Union followed the lead of the United States and also imposed sanctions on Venezuela and also proceeded to push Juan Guaido as the supposed interim president of Venezuela. Now, whatever issues Venezuela had internally, these sanctions have only served to exacerbate them and as a result have spurred on one of the worst displacement crises in the world. According to the United Nations, worldwide, there are over 5 million Venezuelan refugees and migrants and over 800,000 asylum seekers and 2.5 million living under other legal forms of state in the Americas. Sanctions make life hell for the people living there, and this is precisely why so many people are fleeing. The poverty rate has reached record levels and plunged the Venezuelan people into unimaginably cruel conditions. Since Venezuela's economy is so heavily dependent on oil by blocking Venezuela from selling its oil and stealing its, its companies, the U.S. is essentially cutting off funding for social services and government infrastructure. They know this and they do this anyway, hoping that the people will rise up and overthrow their government. To further examine the harsh realities of economic sanctions, I'm joined by Alina Duhan. She is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Negative Impact of the Unilateral Course of Measures on the Enjoyment of Human Rights, or sanctions. Uh, she's also a professor of international law at the Belarusian State University, and she just returned recently from Venezuela. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program, Professor. It's good to have you. It's a pleasure for me. 
I wanted to ask you if you could maybe um, further explain the mechanism of how these sanctions can end up being so devastating for the local currency uh, of another country and, and freezing uh, the assets as well and so forth. And also how that ties into Syria, because the Syrian pound is also experiencing this uh, hyperinflation, specifically after the implementation of the uh, Caesar Act sanctions in June 2020. Uh, the economic situation as well as hyperinflation started to develop in Venezuela as soon as the oil prices drop, started to drop, starting from 2013. So there was a serious economic decrease. And the hyperinflation has already started at that point. When we speak about Syria, the uh, Syrian economy has already been devastated by years of conflict over the years. So we need to take into account that situation was already far, far from good one before sanctions have been imposed. Countries, for example, Venezuela can't sell oil anymore. If we compare with 2015 and 2016, when sanctions started to be imposed, the revenue of Venezuela from selling oil dropped from 100% to 1%. So they started to get only 1% of the money they used to get because of selling oil. The mining sector of Venezuela has also been listed and therefore they can't sell anything, can't export anything they used to get from the mining sector as well. That's why the income has dropped even further. That the assets Venezuela had in the banks of the United States, United Kingdom and Portugal, which upon different assessments were between five and six billion dollars, have been frozen. The country is losing income and can't pay it to social services. And as a result, a lot of social projects which used to be supported by the government, in particular, the government used to provide two meals per day at schools. So children were fat at schools. Now it's limited to one. And this one is usually very small. It doesn't contain protein. So children do not eat at schools anymore. And how would you describe the medical and uh, public health infrastructure in Venezuela at the moment? Uh, how, much, um, how much have these uh, institutions been further imperiled, generally speaking, uh, by these sanctions? Before 2016, the government used to provide the full coverage of medical expenses to every citizen of Venezuela. I was visiting the uh, uh, cardiological child uh, hospital. Traditionally, this hospital was doing 1,500 surgeries, uh, heart surgeries for children per year. Last year, this hospital was only able to do 160 surgeries. So it basically means that more than 1,300 children were not able to get this surgery. I was visiting the hospitals both in Caracas and outside of Caracas. And I have been reported that in some of them, they can't even do, for example, the simple blood test because all the centrifugs are already broken. The majority of hospitals demonstrate that about 80% of equipment is already broken because it's impossible to buy spare parts for the equipment. And traditionally, Venezuela was buying the equipment either from the United States or from Europe. And that's a really serious problem. You know, when the United States announced sanctions, they, they usually say that they're going to make an exception for humanitarian aid, for relief agencies. Does that actually translate into reality? In practice, unfortunately, the majority of these humanitarian uh, exceptions doesn't work. First of all, the procedure to get a permission to deliver humanitarian aid is lengthy and costly. That means that only huge humanitarian organizations have, which have a necessary legal department can be involved into that. A small one can't even effort doing that. Secondly, even if there is a possibility to get a humanitarian exceptions, it still doesn't mean that a company will be able to buy humanitarian goods because, they can't, because of the fear of secondary sanctions. So the majority of banks and the majority of companies outside of the countries will be scared to be involved into transactions. That if you look, for example, at the guidances which have been developed by the European Union as concerned the delivery of humanitarian aid, uh, 
the burden of proof of the uh, initial humanitarian purpose is laying on humanitarian actors. So the humanitarian organizations create the following situation. They need to find the donors. They need to find a way to get an exception. They need to prove that these goods will be only be used for humanitarian purposes, and they will be responsible if anything will happen. That's why they prefer not to be involved that much in this sphere. And that's why I delivered the guidance on delivery of humanitarian aid at the end of 2020. And I called for some steps to be taken to improve situation with humanitarian exception. But the last point, which is also important, is that usually, even if it's possible to get humanitarian exception, these humanitarian exceptions are only referring to medical goods and to food. It's impossible to get a humanitarian exception to anything else. There are enormous problems, for example, to get humanitarian exceptions for something which could be considered as a dual use goods. In Venezuela, there are a serious problem with spare parts for the medical equipment, spare parts for water, electricity supply, as well as industry responsible for agriculture. And buying this equipment and buying these spare parts is not never considered to be, to fall under humanitarian exceptions. Alina Duhan, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure speaking with you, Professor. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you for interest. We'll be right back after this short break. Similarly to Venezuela, Syria has also been on the receiving end of brutal sanctions imposed by the United States and the European Union, all done in the aim of toppling the Syrian government and effectuating regime change. Syria has undergone the world's worst refugee crisis in modern history. Half of Syria's population has been displaced by this war, even members of my own family. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, the UNHCR, more than 6.6 .6 million Syrians have been forced to flee their homes since 2011 and another 6.7 million people remain displaced inside the country. And on top of all that suffering, the European Union and the United States don't stop there. It's not enough that Western powers have funded armed groups inside Syria to sow chaos or that Israel helped Al-Qaeda fighters because it suited them to see Syria fall. No, on top of all that, they go ahead and, and tighten the noose even further on the Syrian people. It's despicable. In June 2020, the Trump regime implemented the Caesar Act, these sanctions are the most severe and extensive sanctions Syria has ever faced, despite having been under sanctions for decades. Right now in Syria, people are queuing up in bread lines. Bread lines in a country that used to grow its own wheat and have enough wheat left over to export to other countries. People now have to wait hours just to get a little bit of bread that isn't even enough to properly feed a family. This wasn't a thing before the war. This was unheard of. People have drawn comparisons between what's happening now and the way hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were, were viciously starved to death by sanctions in the 1990s. Before the war on Syria started in 2011, one US dollar was equal to 47 Syrian pounds. Now, one dollar is equal to 4,000 Syrian pounds on the black market. This devaluation of the currency and hyperinflation brought on by the war and exacerbated by the Caesar sanctions has completely shattered Syria's economy. And of course, given that Lebanon and Syria's economies are inextricably intertwined and Lebanon is going through its own economic crisis, that doesn't do much to help either. Not only is the United States isolating Syria from the world and cutting off its resources, it's also holding them hostage and occupying Syria's oil fields in the northeast and the breadbasket region where its crops are grown. Last year, Senator Lindsey Graham gleefully exclaimed his approval of the fact that the U.S. had signed a deal with the Kurdish-led SDF to steal Syria's oil and even gloated about these sadistic Caesar Act sanctions, asking like some bloodthirsty monster whether more were coming. Uh, the Caesars Act, uh, thank you for using it quickly and in a holding aside son accountable is a great first step in what I think will be a long journey to punish this regime. Is more coming? Yes, Senator. Uh, thank you. Great job. According to the latest report from the World Food Program, a record 12.4 million Syrians, that's nearly 60% of the population, are now food insecure. In just over one year, an additional 4.5 million Syrians have become food insecure. Sean O'Brien, the uh, World Food Program's representative and country director in Syria, said that the, quote, situation has never been worse. 
Basic foods to feed a family for a month, bread, rice, lentils, and oil and sugar, now cost at least 120,000 Syrian pounds, which far exceeds the average salaries. Over the last year, food prices across Syria have soared, and the price of basic items has increased by 236%, just as the value of the Syrian pound has plummeted. On average, the price of oil has increased from 1,000 Syrian pounds in January 2020 to 5,000 Syrian pounds in January 2021. UN Special Rapporteur Alina Duhan once again called on the United States to remove unilateral sanctions on Syria, saying, quote, The sanctions violate the human rights of the Syrian people, whose country has been destroyed by almost 10 years of ongoing conflict. The broad sweep of the United States sanctions law that went into effect in June could target any foreigner helping in reconstruction of the devastated country and even employees of foreign companies and humanitarian operators helping rebuild Syria. To talk more about these brutal Caesar Act sanctions that are gripping the Syrian population, journalist Vanessa Bealy joins me from Damascus. Vanessa, thank you for taking the time. I know you don't have a lot of electricity at the moment, ironically, because of the sanctions. How are you doing? I love how they always term when I say they, of course, I'm talking about the U.S. coalition, uh, the U.S., U.K., EU, who are uh, imposing these sanctions on the Syrian people. Let's make this really clear. You know, sanctions never target what our governments tell you that they are targeting. They target the people, some of the poorest and some of the most um, destabilized, traumatized people who have already gone through a 10 year war. You know, I, the first point I have to make is that Al Qaeda are not under sanctions. The SDF are not under sanctions. ISIS are not under sanctions inside Syria, right? Let's make that really clear. Humanitarian aid that comes into Bab al Hawa in Idlib on the border with Turkey is being taken by Al Qaeda and is being used as part of their mafia operation to provide them with revenue. OK, so let's make this really clear. Sanctions don't apply to the terrorists and extremist groups and the proxies of the U.S. coalition. They only apply to those people that are living under the protection of the Syrian state and its allies by choice. And you have to remember that the sanctions here are on top of policies like the burning of crops, uh, the occupation of oil resources and the theft of those oil resources. America doesn't want the oil. It wants to deprive the Syrian people of that oil and to provide revenue for its proxies, in this case, or the Kurdish separatists. So how are people actually holding up without these uh, commodities and you know, electricity and gas? Because you see pictures of people lining up for bread now. I've heard stories of people putting on layers of clothes just to keep warm. So how, how are people managing without these necessities? Uh, the U.S. occupation of the oil means that the refineries under, under their protection of the Syrian government are not receiving oil supplies. So the electrical power stations are not running uh, efficiently. Um, there is no uh, gas for heating. There's no oil for heating. Uh, the other day, yesterday, in fact, I drove past a queue of around 15 kilometers for fuel for cars, right? And this has been the situation since I've been here, which is almost two years now. Um, electricity wise, we're on uh, four hours off, two hours on. So effectively every day, I only really get six working hours of electricity as I call it. Um, in the next suburb, they're lucky if they get one hour per day. Can you maybe describe um, how much prices have gone up and, and how much, uh... Everything has gotten more expensive because, you know, you've spent a couple of years in Syria. So, I mean, you've actually known how it was before, e even though that, that was, of course, still during wartime. But but still. Well, I mean, people are always saying to me, for example, a kilo of chicken <laughs> previously would have been um, less than a thousand Syrian pounds. Right now, with inflation and with the scarcity of food, it's 20. Oh, no, it's more than 10,000 a kilo. So prices have gone up 10 times. People are still earning, let's say, uh, I mean, a Syrian Arab army soldier is still on a salary of around $50, right? But they're expected to pay 10 times what they were paying before for food, for, for heating, for gas. I mean, gas now, I think when I first came, it was around 15,000 Syrian pounds for a, for a gas canister. It's now 35,000, 40,000. 
and you're, you know, you have to queue to get it. So, Vanessa, what are your thoughts on the mainstream media, uh, especially in the West, how they're reporting on the sanctions or perhaps not uh, reporting? And it's astounding to me how Western media spins this story. You know, they talk about uh, it all being down to the Assad regime. But in reality, the reason there are bread queues, you know, the, the Syrian government has maintained its provision of bread throughout the 10 years of this war, despite all of the hardships, the sanctions, the, the terrorist attacks, etc. cetera. Um, and now it can't, but why? Because as, you, as we've mentioned, the burning of the crops during the summer across the country, the burning of forestry, the burning of cotton crops, the burning of uh, olive plantations, Right. And right now, the SDF, the Kurdish Contras, are stealing um, the wheat and barley still right now. And they're trading it cross border, just as they're doing with the oil. And by the way, the oil is providing revenue not only for the SDF, but the SDF are then sending it to Al Qaeda and Idlib for processing. How would you describe the morale? How would how do you see the Syrian people? Are they tolerating it? Are, are they being resilient? How's the general psychology and uh, you know, how are they holding up given that they've gone through so much, uh, so many years of war and now on top of it, sanctions? Look, Syrian people, as you know, are incredibly resourceful, incredibly resilient, incredibly steadfast. And as they always do, they're making the best of it. But um, they're exhausted. You know, as I said before, Syria right now should be um, rebuilding. For me, I think the most heartbreaking thing is the medical sector. I mean, I had a meeting with the deputy health minister last week and um, chronic illnesses, they're just not able to cope with because um, the machinery and equipment and uh, analysis equipment that they need is, is breaking down. They can't get spare parts because uh, European countries are not allowed to deal with them. And, you know, the saddest thing, in, there are doctors. Most of these doctors, Syrian doctors, have trained in the EU. So they have contacts and they have established uh, collaboration in the EU. But they're not allowed to collaborate under the sanctions, even for the medical sector, even for kids that have cancer. You know, this is the insanity that people need to understand. There is nothing humanitarian or um, protective about sanctions. It is all about destruction. It is all about killing people, really. Sanctions kill people. That's what we need to kind of get into our heads. According to the latest figures from the United Nations Population Fund, around 30% of the Syrian population are between the ages of zero and 14. Another 30% of Syrians are between the ages of 10 and 24. That means that 60% of Syria's population is under the age of 24. The vast majority of them have grown up in war, they've grown up with trauma, and on top of it, they're being starved and slowly choked to death now with sanctions. If that isn't heartbreaking and the definition of cruelty, I don't know what is. How on earth does anyone justify putting an entire generation of children through war, depriving them of education, and slowly murdering them with sanctions? These people are sick. They have no conscience. They're cruel. They're evil. It's very easy for them to claim that they're morally superior and that these countries, oh, they're ruled by dictators and they mismanage their economies and they cause all this. But these Western powers, they know precisely that the sanctions they inflict on others are ineffective and will ruin lives and kill civilians overseas. And they choose to do it anyway. And then they have the nerve to accuse the governments they're targeting for regime change of being responsible. This is their way of shirking responsibility and keeping this narrative going of, oh, look how brutal this regime is. We need to go and get rid of them. That's what gangsters and criminals do when they don't get their way and they can't profit off of someone else. They punish, they hurt, they lie, they kill, they steal. That's what the United States, the United Kingdom, and their allies do. They inflict immeasurable suffering on millions of people, on millions of civilians all over the world who've done nothing wrong. Whatever they accuse Chavez, Maduro, Al Assad of doing, it pales in comparison to the barbarous and cold-blooded siege warfare that they impose on the people of Venezuela, Syria, Iran, Cuba, Yemen, and others. The United States and their allies think that they can use sanctions to intimidate Venezuela, intimidate Syria, intimidate Iran, and others. They think that bullying and stealing and, and starving us is going to work, but they are sorely mistaken. All they have done is increase the resilience and strengthen the resolve of the oppressed. The people of Venezuela, they're not going anywhere. 
The people of Syria, they will not be intimidated. The people of Iran, Cuba, Yemen, and the global south will never bend the knee to imperialist bullies and war criminals. Solidarity to all. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Richard Medhurst, and this is The Communique.